who are the most influential and authoritative world changers and history makers? You'd be surprised who God chooses to be among the pillars of the earth, those who are the supportive structure of his kingdom in this world. Find out on this episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity. This episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity is all about our calling to be the pillars of the earth. This is an amazing, poetical, prophetical, metaphorical symbol in Scripture that means so much. What do you think of when you think of a pillar? I think of things like that which is high, that which is exalted, that which is inclined toward heaven, that that strikes awe in the heart of the beholder, that which is permanent and enduring, that which is a symbol of authority and strength and firmness. There's so many things that a pillar represents. A pillar often in the Old Testament represented a covenant commitment that was made between individuals. And so it speaks, once again, of that which is permanent in the sight of heaven. And so our calling to be the pillars of the earth is a multifaceted emblem And I believe it's going to really be a blessing to you as you see the unfolding of the revelation. Now, let's go to the backstory, what leads up to this particular title being placed on the people of God. And to go there, we have to go to 1 Samuel. And this is the account of the conflict between Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, and his other wife, Peninnah or some have pronounced it Panina. And Panina, or Panina, had children, but Hannah did not. And she was constantly berating Hannah. Hannah felt like she was, uh, she, she was unimportant. She felt like she was just uh, extra baggage because she wasn't giving Elkanah children, and she was just another mouth to feed. And I'm sure Panina, uh constantly reminded her of that and belittled her. And that just drove her to her knees because sometimes persecution and ridicule and rejection from other people does drive you closer to God. And she went to the tabernacle and she was pouring her heart out. She uh, was seeking God for a child and she told God if he would give her a child, she would give that child back to him. And Eli, the high priest, saw her muttering, it seemed. She wasn't speaking out loud, but her mouth was moving. And he said, put away your wine from you, woman. And she said, don't count me a daughter of Belial, which is an epithet for Satan. It means worthlessness because Satan is a worthless entity. And what he is behind in this world has no worth associated with it. And so to be a daughter or a son of Belial is to be a son or daughter of worthlessness. Your life is worthless. It has no worth in the sight of heaven. And she said, don't count me to be a daughter of Belial. But uh, I have poured out my heart before the Lord. She was a poured out person. She sought God with passion, with a consuming desire. And Eli responded to her and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And I love the next line, because it said in her response to him, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so she went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Isn't that an amazing thing that she doesn't know she's pregnant yet, but one word from the man she considered to be God's representative was enough to switch her from depression to high levels of expectation. And that's the way we should be. As soon as we get a word from God, from the written word or from the living word, I don't care how depressing our circumstances are. 
we should wipe the frown off of our faces and start smiling in anticipation. Don't just be the kind of person who can smile after the miracle happens. But if you can smile before it happens, that's a real demonstration of faith. And of course, she did get pregnant. The son was born. She called his name Samuel, which means God has heard. So she didn't forget that it was God who moved in her life. And then when she went through this miraculous divine intervention, she launched into this beautiful song of praise. I don't know if it was spontaneous and prophetic or if it was something she wrote over a lengthy period, but it contains one particular line that is absolutely intense, that is one of my favorite verses in the entire Old Testament. And it's uh, uh, chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, verse 8, where, he, uh, where she said, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. The New King James says, the King James Version says, the dunghill, which I prefer, so we'll use that. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to inherit the throne of glory. Now, here's the key verse. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. So who are these individuals she is referring to as the pillars of the earth? It's the ones she describes in the verse prior, that he lifts the poor from the dust and the beggar from the dunghill. Well, what does the dust represent? Do you remember in the beginning, dust you are, unto dust you shall return. It represents mortality, these dust bodies, and they were made from the dust of the earth. God did not make Adam from dirt. Dirt has value. You can plant seed in it. You can bring forth flowers and vegetables and fruits from dirt, but dust has no value. And I believe God made Adam from the dust of the earth for a primary reason, and that was to make his creature of highest worth from a substance of least worth. It's the kingdom of heaven principle called the mustard seed principle, how the smallest of seeds becomes the greatest of herbs. And often, God uses the smallest things in life for the greatest outcomes, and it just takes time. Give God time. But anyway, uh, Hannah said he raises the poor from the dust, and dust represents our mortality, and the beggar from the dunghill. Well, what does the dunghill represent? Well, the lower nature, the base side of human beings. Dung is manure. It's the filthy side of our nature that has to be subdued. And if he raises the poor from the dust, is that just talking about those who are poor financially or materially? I tend to think it means those who have poverty of spirit, those who are willing to admit their bankruptcy in Adam, that without God, they're bankrupt mentally, bankrupt emotionally, bankrupt spiritually, bankrupt in every way, unable to do anything of any worth in this world without being in a relationship with God. And when you acknowledge that, you have poverty of spirit. Jesus started his, his Sermon on the Mount with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you've got to admit your complete lack in Adam in order to get the completeness of what God can give you, the kingdom of heaven, and all that is comprised of. Wow. So he raises the poor from the dust, from the bonds of mortality, and he raises the beggar from the dunghill. Why a beggar? Because a beggar is someone that realizes he has to plead for a pittance just to survive. And he's not afraid to do that. And he's not too proud to do that because he realizes it's a matter of life and death. And I believe there's a certain point in our journey where we have to realize it's a matter of life and death, whether or not I attract God's attention. 
And there was a time when I pled with him, if you will, to use this kind of word. I begged him. I was a beggar. I begged him, have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. I'm not worthy of you, Lord, but come into my life. And he raised me from the dunghill of my lower nature and set me among princes, the sons of the king. Wow. Isn't that what every born-again, blood-washed child of God is? It's a royal family, a family full of authority that has inherited kingdom power and kingdom provision from the king of kings who rules over the kingdom of God in this world. So God raises us from the dust and the dunghill to set us among princes and to what? Inherit the throne of glory. Whose throne is that? It has to be God's throne. The throne where the Shekinah rests. Well, of course, his representative throne on earth was the mercy seat. It was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, but that was only a symbol of a heavenly mercy seat where the Shekinah in all of its celestial glory radiates. And so God says, I'll take you from the absolute bottom to the absolute top. I'll take you from the dust and the dunghill all the way up to inherit the throne of glory. And to inherit his throne is more profound than just approaching his throne, even coming boldly to his throne. To inherit the throne is to share the right to sit in the throne. And isn't that what Jesus invites his people to do? He said, he who overcomes, the same will sit with me in my throne. As also I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So to sit in God's throne, what does that mean? The throne is the position of rest. The throne is the position of power. The throne is the position of authority. The throne is the position of dominion. And if you're seated with Christ in his throne, it's the position, number five, of decree, where you can speak authoritatively, you can speak with the dominion that Adam lost, restored into your life, where you have authority over the negatives that come against you in life, and you can speak words of faith that counteract all the attacks of the enemy and all the strategy of the enemy to destroy you. And then the next line says, for, so there's a hinge there. You are delivered from the dust and the dunghill. You're joined to a family of God's royal seed. You inherit his throne. And then it says, for, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. In other words, God's got some people he's raised up by grace. And the name Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the one who brought forth this song, that name, Hannah, means grace. It took grace for her to endure the ridicule of her adversary, Panana. And, and it took grace for her to push herself to pray until she got her miraculous breakthrough. And I believe it will take grace for you to become everything God's called you to be. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and listen to the next line, and he has set the world upon them. So the future of this planet is dependent on the faithful, pillar-like commitment that certain ordained individuals have had to their calling and to their purpose. Hannah was a pillar of intercession. The son she dedicated to God, Samuel, was a pillar of prophecy who restored Israel to true religion. And he was the one who anointed a little shepherd boy named David who came, became a pillar of worship, who taught Israel a higher level of seeking God. He took the ark away from the tabernacle of Moses after it was returned from Philistine captivity and put it in the tabernacle of David where there was no separating veil. And the glory of God just radiated into that tabernacle where the priests were in constant worship 24-7. He lifted Israel into a whole new level 
of an effective way of seeking God. He was a pillar. He brought down Goliath. He conquered the Philistines. He was a pillar in Israel in his day. And there have been hundreds of pillars on whom the future of the earth rested. And sometimes God chooses the most unlikely individuals to be a pillar of the earth. Jump over into the New Testament. What about the ones Jesus chose as his primary disciples? Not the most educated in Israel. Not those who had studied under rabbinical authorities. Not those who had the admiration of the people, but kind of the off-scouring. The fishermen, the tax collectors, and especially tax collectors, were not well-loved in Israel in that day. And, and even a murderer of Christians named Saul, who was doing everything he could to stamp out the name of Jesus, was really ordained and chosen to be a pillar of the earth. So who does God choose to fill this role? It's not always the ones you think are qualified. God doesn't always call the qualified, but he always qualifies the call. And I like to put it this way, that if God had been able to find 10 people who upheld the truth in Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have continued to this day because there were not enough pillars of the earth in that city to prevent that judgment from falling then Sodom suffered the consequences. Gomorrah suffered the consequences of devouring fire falling from above. Well, if just 10 devoted, consecrated people in Sodom could have prevented that judgment, I wonder what kind of impact you're having if you're a prayerful person, if you're walking in holiness, if you're walking in covenant commitment to God. I just wonder how dependent your family is on you without them knowing it how dependent your community is on you without them knowing it. Just your presence in a city can change the whole atmosphere of the city. And I know that sounds a little outlandish to some people, but listen, when you walk with God, there's visible results and there's invisible results. And I could go into that a lot more. I want to take you to a New Testament scripture. If we are pillars of the earth, then that leads right up to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Paul writes his pastor protege, Timothy, and he says, If I should delay that you may know how, you ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So the church in its entirety is a pillar a huge pillar, in a sense, hovering over the entire human race. But every local church is an individual pillar with influence over a city. And every individual Christian is a pillar of the truth with influence over family members and a community. But we're all called to be a pillar and foundation of the truth. And how does that happen? How does that take place in our lives? Well, the way to become a pillar of the truth is to have the truth so embedded in you, you become a primary promoter of truth. And if you're born of the Spirit, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. And if you have been begotten of the Word of God, the Bible calls the Word of God the Word of truth. And so truth is a part of your nature now. That's why it's second nature, or really, I should say, first nature for you to tell the truth. You don't gravitate toward lying. You gravitate toward truth telling because truth is so much more, more a part of you than the deceptiveness that fills this world. I believe I need to continue with this theme on the next podcast because there's so much more territory that needs to be covered. And I want you to encourage yourself that you have more importance in the plan of God and the purpose of God than maybe you've given yourself credit for because you identify yourself with who you used to be, the dust and the dung hill. But God identifies you with what you are right now, a co-heir of his throne 
who is an influential person and who can impact your generation as a world changer and a history maker. That's who you are. Walk in it in Jesus' name.